If you have your Bibles, uh, there's two scriptures we're going to look at. One is in Joshua, chapter number 1. <clears throat> if you uh, look at the first five books of the Bible, those were written by Moses, and then everything changed. Uh, Moses died, and uh, the one who was named Joshua, who was actually born in slavery in Egypt, uh, was one of those uh, two million Jews that left the slavery in Egypt and spent the 40 years out in the wilderness. 40 years out in the wilderness. It would have taken anybody else two weeks to go from where they were to the promised land, but it took them 40 years. That's a detour I don't want to take, amen? I think we spend way too much time in the, the wilderness anyway. But we're going to look in Joshua chapter number 1. And we're going to look in Hebrews in the New Testament, chapter number 4. Right, I'm going to read you two verses, though, um, that kind of will set the tone for what I want to share. This is, you don't have to look. I'm just going to read them for you real quickly. Romans 15, verse 4 says this. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning. The word literally means they were written for our instruction so that we could be taught. Something we didn't know. And these things were written down so that we could learn that instruction. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6, the Bible says this, Now these things became our examples. And he's actually talking about the children of Israel as they uh, left the bondage of Egypt and, and they went into the, the wilderness. Like I said, it could have been a, a two-week trip, but it took them a whole lot longer than that. It took them 40 years. 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, Right? He said, but we should learn from their example. And in the 11th verse of 1 Corinthians 10, it says this. Now, all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition. A lot of people look at the Old Testament, and they look at Israel, and they say, well, that's, that was them. That's the Old Testament. We're, we're, we're Christians. We're followers of Christ. Well, they were supposed to be followers of Christ, too, the Messiah. They were supposed to be the followers of, uh, of listening to the Word of God and, and, and being obedient unto that Word. And the problem was is that they had unbelief. That's what it said in Hebrews 3. Because of their unbelief, poison. Unbelief is poison to the Christian. And we, we need to understand that God wants us to move from, from the bondage of Egypt. I'm going to give you four quick steps. Let's just put them right here up front. We need to move out of those things that puts us in bondage. That's the symbol of where we were before salvation, right? We were in the bondage to sin. We need to move out of that. They crossed over the Red Sea, but then they moved into the wilderness. And, and we, don't, we don't come, as soon as we get saved, we, we, we have everything the Spirit wants us to have, but there are also some things in our life that, that we've got to learn. We've got to walk with Him. We've got to grow. And so we, th that, that time there was a time of, are you going to believe or are you not going to believe? And for those that didn't believe, it cost them 40 years. But then you, you had to go out, and then they had to go through the wilderness. But then they got to the promise of what God laid before them, and they got to the Jordan River. And you got to go in. This series has been called Choosing Victory. You, you chose victory when you, cho you chose Jesus to be your Savior and Lord, but you got to walk it out. In the New Testament, it talks about abiding with Him. The Christian life is to accept Him and come to know Him and to experience Him. Not only in heaven, the Christian life is not just a destination. It's a walk. It's new life. And, and, and some want to just say, well, I got saved. One day I'm going to heaven. I mean, I'm living in a world like hell now, but I, one day I'm going to get there. Listen, he gave us victory not only after we die, but he wants us to have victory today. Plain, simple trust in a God that's gracious, that loves us, that has promises of blessing for us. So you have to go in, and then you got to go on through. Even after you learn to choose victory, if you think for a second that I'm preaching one of those sermons that just trust in Jesus and, and everything's going to be uh, just, just gloriously hallelujah, everything's going to, you're going to get happy, you're going to get rich, you're going to get, uh, everybody's going to love you, you'll get all the fame, you'll get all the, 
that's garbage, right? You have the victory because Jesus is in you. But just understand, all those people that had the joy of the Lord still went through hardships. It's called life. If you're looking for something that's a bypass, no, we'll get that when we get to heaven. Amen? Where, where there will be no more sorrow, there will be no more pain, there will be no more crying. Everybody will love everybody. But right now, I don't think everybody loves everybody. I think there's still some difficulties. There's still some hardships. And he, listen to me now. Christ is telling us that he'll be with us in the hardships. He'll be with us in the circumstances. He'll prove that Christianity works by letting us go through some of the most difficult things. Because if, it, if not, if, if we didn't go through difficult things, we wouldn't need Christ. And the world would just look at us and say, well, they're just blessed. Well, I am blessed, but they need to know the reason why I'm blessed. So we need to understand that God wants us to go out so that we can go through, so that we can go into the victory, and then go on to glory every step of the way, trusting Christ. So anything else is just vanity. I mean, you can follow the wisdom of this world, and you may build a worldly business. You can follow the truths of this world, and you can raise a worldly child. You can follow the successes of this world, and, and you can have a lot of uh, the, the joys that this world can give you. But Solomon said that they were fleeting. He called it vanity. He called it like a vapor. And really, if you think about all the people in this world, a lot of them that have all the things that so many people are trying to get, fame, money, all the, the happiness of this life, all the joys, they don't want to leave anything out. Those people are some of the most miserable people you'll ever want to meet. They may have the biggest house, they may have the best clothes and drive the nicest of cars and have nobody to share it with. They may go through one divorce or two divorces or three divorces or four divorces. They, they may go through uh, this job and that job and that job. And they, they used to have that friend and they got mad at them. And then they had this other group of friends and they got mad at them. And this boss fired them. And I mean, it's just, look, that sickness, this sickness, that trouble, that bankruptcy, all those things in life are just those things that are there. But God allowed us to have this blessed thing called life. But we need to learn that he is the God of life. He said, I have come that you may not only have life, but you may have it abundantly. That's not just getting a ticket to heaven, but it's learning that heaven's not a destination. Heaven is Jesus in me. I'm going to go to a place that he is, right? And, and we call that place heaven. Amen. I'm going to be there one day. I'm going to say bye to this world. I'm going to close my eyes to this sin-filled world, and I'm going to open my eyes to see him. Absent from the body, present with the Lord but there's a lot of living that he wants me to live between now and then. And that's what this scripture is all about. If you have your Bible in Joshua chapter number one, stand with me in honor of reading God's word. Joshua 1 verse 1, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, by the way, wrote the first five books of the Bible. Amazing man, prophet of God, man of God. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. Listen, that's past tense. But yet that's something that's, they haven't even gotten to yet. The promises of God, he's already promised them. He's already placed them before us. He said, but you're going to walk them out. Every place that the sole of your feet, listen to me, Christian, is already conquered territory. God's already given it. It's already yours. It's there for you. But you still have to walk it out. He said, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness from, and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, that's the Mediterranean, toward the going down of the sun, shall be to you territory, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you 
all the days of your life. That's what cost them 40 years earlier, fear. They didn't think they could do it. But God's already told them that they could. He said, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to the fathers to give them. Only be strong, very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, you, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Let's pray. Father, I, I pray for us today. We need to hear this, so Lord, give us ears to hear you. Give us a heart that is open to you. Magnify the word in our hearts, in our, in our sight, in our thoughts, in our mind. Lord, in our will. So that we can see you and know the promises that you have for us. Lord, you didn't leave us to strive in difficulty and failure, but you gave us a road to walk, but you promised to be there with us. Teach us what this means, O oh Lord. Teach us how we can actually live every day like this. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. I want to just share a few things real quickly from Joshua 1. And then I want us to go and I'm headed towards Hebrews 4 because there's something there that's blessed me so very much in talking about this example. When, when God is speaking to Joshua, he wanted to, Joshua to know that this was for him. He said, Moses, my servant is dead. I've been with Moses. I, I was there to protect him when he was born. I allowed him to be raised in Pharaoh's household there in Egypt. I taught him to write when nobody else knew, knew how to write. He was educated. But yet, he had to come to know me. So where did God send him? To the wilderness. Yeah, he was running from a, for a crime that he committed. A crime of passion, a crime of doing something in the heat of the moment. Have y'all ever sinned in the heat of the moment? You ever did something that you look back on and said, I wish I really hadn't done that? That really was Moses' life. And he spent 40 years on what the Scripture calls, get this now, not just the wilderness. They, they said it this way. The backside of the wilderness. Have you ever felt like you encamped in the backside of the wilderness? Lord, have you forgotten me? For 40 years, he just dealt with dumb old sheep. Well, then God met him. God called him. God sent him to Egypt. But God didn't send him to do the work. He just wanted Moses to be a frontline spokesman for the goodness of God, and then Moses would just be there to witness the power of God being manifested. And by the way, the power of God was there, and Pharaoh, who would not let them go, told them that they had to go. And the direction of God led the children of Israel, not only was out of Egypt, but to that place by the Red Sea, with mountains on this side, mountains on this side, an angry army behind them, and the Red Sea before them. What were they were to do? Trust God. Believe God and walk it out. And God made a way and they walked through in peace. But when they got there, the law was given. And they were living it out in that society of life, in those questions of life. And God led the, 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 the people to go and spy out the land. Twelve of them went in. All said it was beautiful. All said that the fruit was amazing. The, the territory was wonderful and glorious. But, but ten of them said, I don't know about this. We can't do this. We're not soldiers. They, they got fortified cities in there. This, the, the, yes, it's amazing. It's good. But there's giants over there, and, and we can't do this. Unbelief. Let me remind you once again, unbelief spreads. And for 40 years, everyone 20 years and older died in the wilderness because of unbelief. 
that wasn't known God. That was on them. If you're going to get saved and lived in the wilderness, if you want to follow the, the wisdom of this world, if you want to have your PhD in just accumulating things down here, but not accumulating things in here, which is your spirit, which will live with other, where you can take it home to heaven and be with him, where you can make a difference for eternity down here, that your life have purpose and meaning. If you don't want to do that, just get ready for some dry, dusty days, some lonely, hard days in the wilderness. But God said something to Joshua. You know I was with Moses, but I'll be with you. You, Joshua. I want you, by the listening to the Holy Spirit of God, don't listen to my voice, but listen right now to the Holy Spirit of God. God's saying, I got you. I love you. You may think God loves me. Guess what? You're right. He does love me. Amen? That would have been a good amen moment. Right? But guess what? God loves you. Amen? That should have been an even greater amen moment. Jeremiah was a prophet of God. Jeremiah spoke faithfully the, the things of God and, and he, in prison for doing the right thing. Instead of saying that God had forgot him and he was mad and angry and all that, and by the way, jo Jeremiah got depressed every now and again, but he said words like this, I know the plans I have for you, saith the Lord. Plans for good, not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Just to understand, I was with them. I'll be with you. In the same way that God was with the heroes of the Bible, He'll be with you. <clears throat> the same Holy Spirit <coughs> who was with Christ and led him and was with him <clears throat> when he gave life back to Jesus and rose from the grave. Listen, that wasn't a different Holy Spirit. That was the same Holy Spirit. He hasn't lost his strength now because the world is sinful. The same leadership, the same guidance, the same power, the very same Spirit of God loves you and wants to bless you in exactly the same way that he blessed him. Light shines better in darkness. And by the way, this is a dark world. It's sin. It's everywhere. But God wants to use us as examples of that great light. And the more broken you are is the more that the essence of God can come through you and emanate in this world. I want you to hear this. In the spirit of your soul, God loves you and God wants to bless you. This is not just for those. This is for you. But secondly, he said, there is victory. I like this in verse 3. He said, every place that the sole of your feet will tread upon, I have given you. Did y'all get that? Everywhere you go, every step you take is conquered ground. Already been conquered. It's already yours. Hold on. Everything that happens to me in my life, God's already seen it. And God already knows it. And God's, because of that, he, he knows his plans. He knows that they're for good. <clears throat> so all those things are put in place. He's not upset by it or anything like that. So he says, if you will walk with me, New Testament, John 15 calls it abiding with him. Right? If you'll just come to know me, then experience me. That's what the word know means. It means not just to, to hear about it or read about it, but it means to experience it. So what does it mean to honor God? Well, you're going to have to walk it out. You're going to have to get in your circumstances and walk it out. What does it mean to trust God? Well, you know what you're supposed to do, and you know how to do it, but are you going to do it? What does it mean to love God, to cherish God, to find value in Him no matter what? Well, He's going to let you be put in some places where, where, where you're going to just really have to say, 
I don't understand this. This does not make sense. I, I can't change this. But Lord, I trust you and walk it out. Every place, every day, no matter what you go through in life, take a step back and know that God's got this. It's a parade of victory. I mean, the battle's already been won. When, the, when the, those go off to fight the battles and, and, and they come back after they're victorious, then they come back and celebrate. He's telling us, Calvary took care of it. The empty tomb, it sealed it. Christ is alive and well and with you. You don't have to strive to win the battle. He's already won the battle. All you have to do is walk with him daily through the battle. Yeah, cross over the Jordan. Yeah, there's going to be some Jerichos out there. He'll deliver. There's going to be some giants to fight. He's got it. You know what amazed me? All those years in the wilderness, the clothes didn't wear out. The manna didn't wear out. He continued to feed them. Even their shoes didn't wear out. How, how'd y'all? I think some of y'all do have some of them 40 year old shoes, don't you? Amen. Don't even have to retread them, they just still keep on keeping on. Amen. God just takes care of us. But he says, be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. You know what he's not saying? He's not saying, hey, go out there and flex your muscles. Show the world what you can do. No. Our strength is in the Lord. Philippians says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God's not looking me to go out there and whip, whip somebody. By the way, we like to talk about David and Goliath. Who won? Do you think all that was David? Come on. You think God had a hand in that? Do you think maybe God's hand was on David's hand when he slung that rock? You think God's hand will be on your hand? I got it more than that. I don't want just his hand. I want his hand. But I want to be in the shadow of his wing. I want, to, I want him to put his arm around me so I can feel the heartbeat. I want the love of God just to that y'all know what it's like to be around somebody and you just feel loved. I want, I want that every day, no matter what. Do you, do you feel loved by this world? Or do you feel beat down by this world? Which would you rather have? If you can't understand that this is the most practical message, because we're going to walk through this life, it's just a matter of, are you going to do it on your own? You're going to follow the worldly wisdom? You're going to follow all those things? You're going to... You're going to uh, strive to achieve all that they say that you can have? Or are you simply going to say that there is a God, I believe in Him, I trust Him, I know He can save me, He can take me and cleanse me, He can carry me to heaven one day. I guess He's got this earth too. I guess He can take care of my life too. And by the way, all the other things that He did, He didn't come to get my approval of first. So I may be walking through something, and, and what I'm wanting to do is to know all about it and kind of to tell God how to do it so that I get the outcome that I want. Um, he's never done anything else like that, but I can tell you this. Listen to your pastor. Time after time after time after time after time. I've been with him. I've trusted him. And I look back on it. He's always been faithful. He's never come up short, not only once. Not once. Now, I've come up short plenty of times. But he's never left me there. And he's, I love this. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So be strong and a very, very courageous. It takes something to trust in God. It takes courage to trust in God. It takes courage to not trust in yourself. Any control freaks out here want to handle things? 
You know, can I confess? I am the world's worst, worst attitude driving down the road. Now, I don't ever get mad at people, but I hate them Toyotas and them Chevrolets and them minivans and them Subarus with 72 bumper stickers on the back window. Y'all ever seen them? And then pickup trucks that hadn't been washed in 22 years and the owner of it's proud of it. And they come in and I'm, I'm, going, I'm going up down the four lane out here and I, I'm traveling along just a little over the speed limit. I got to be in this, I'm, I'm preaching so I got to tell the truth. Just a little over the speed limit. And somebody will pull out in front of me 20 miles an hour. Now, I, I can tell them, I call them an idiot. And, 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 and I tell them that, that, that Chevrolet has no idea what's going on. How rude of them, right? And I, I, I'm doing this going down the road, and I'll say, why did they do that? Well, they, should have done, they should not have done that. Don't pull in front of me. Why didn't they speed up? Didn't they see that? They should have known better than that. I mean, I am the biggest control freak of everybody else's vehicle. Amen? And if I'm ever riding with my wife, my wife says I'm a control freak over how she drives the vehicle. Isn't that how we do things in life sometimes? Now, I, I will confess to you, I don't do it outside of the car like I do it in the car. And then sometimes I feel bad because I drive by them and I look over at them and I see them looking at me and then I feel guilty. You know? I mean, it, it, it's, it's different from, from not liking the Chevrolet, but if I see Susie over there or something, I'm, then, I, then I feel bad. Then I repent, right? Look, he says... <clears throat> What you need to do is to let go and let God. Take your Bible, look in Hebrews chapter number 4. There's a word that I want you to see and hear and know. I want it to be very much a part of your vocabulary. And there's, if I, if I today said to you, how many of you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? You would say, all right, some of you don't. How many of you believe that he was God's son that came to earth? How many of you believe he lived a sinless life? How many of you believe that he was obedient even to the place of the cross? He gave his life, they buried him, but three days later he rose again. And you bet your eternity on that. Amen? And you know that God loves you. But you're not too sure about this word here that he says that we're supposed to have, and it's called rest. Look at the last verse of chapter 3. It goes like this. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. That's one of those, those that died those 40 years out in the wilderness. But then in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Therefore, because of these things, since a promise remains of entering, whose rest? Whose rest? God's rest. Is God worrying? Is God fretting? Is God mixed up and doesn't know what's about to happen? Is he nervous? Is God okay? I mean, as he's on the throne and he sees the, I mean, we look at, we listen to the news and we look at the world and we say, this place is upside down. Is God up in heaven going, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, Hall County, Georgia, United States, my planet Earth, I don't know what I'm going to do about them. He's got it. He's at rest. He's at peace. He's got you. He promised. The promise, it says, remains. Did you hear me? The same promise that he gave Adam and Eve, the same promise that he gave Noah, the same promise that he gave Abraham, the same promise that he gave David, the same promise that he gave Malachi, it's the same promise he gave me. It sustained Jesus. Jesus lives by his spirit in me. I think he can sustain me. 
and he calls it rest. The word rest means a cessation, a stopping. So if I'm, if I'm anxious in my life, he says, stop it. If I'm worrying, he says, stop it. Pray, but don't worry. If I'm angry, he says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. If I'm angry with someone, he says, forgive and receive forgiveness. He says, come unto me, all you that are weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly at heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. Are y'all good with that? He promised rest. Come unto me, all ye that are weary and are heavy laden, and learn of me. Maybe there's some things I don't know yet. Maybe there's some things that I would never even venture to learn unless circumstances push me into it. But no matter what the circumstance is, I'll find Christ there and I'll find his rest there. No matter what it is that I'm facing, I'm not facing it alone. I'm yoked up with him. So whatever load I'm having to bear, I'm bearing it with him, bearing it with me. He doesn't take it all off. I feel the load. But I could not bear it alone. He knows how much I can bear, and he will not allow more than that to come upon me. So knowing that, I don't worry and fret and become anxious. I trust. I believe. And I'm learning. Come on now. I'm, I'm, come, I'm learning to rest. Can I also confess that I'm not there yet? Matter of fact, I, I knew that I was going to be preaching this now in the spring. But I didn't know how significant it was going to be to me then. In April, it became more significant. In May, it became more significant. In June, it became more significant. In July, it, will be, it has become more significant. I dare say that in August, it's going to be just as significant. This is not just something that, that God's saying, I, 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 won't, I won't preach your Brian to preach this sermon so you can feel good and go home and put your feet up and just continue doing things the way that you're always doing. That would lead you into a 40-day journey in the wilderness. But there is a rest if you want to enter in. Look what he says. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So when they heard the word, they said, oh, that's fine and good, but it's not going to change my life. But if you can take faith, which means I don't see it, I don't understand it, yet I believe it and I trust it, and I'm going to act it out. How many times I've heard people say, well, I know the Bible says, but well, you just threw away your rest right there. I know I'm supposed to, but, and it's usually, you don't understand. Man, I wish I had a dollar for everybody told me I didn't understand. And guess what? I don't understand, but Christ does. And there may be some things that you've gone through that I've gone through too. Maybe I can encourage you. Maybe you've gone through some things that I haven't gone through, and you can encourage me. But the, here's the thing is, God said, I will be with you. If you will put the faith in it, I'll meet you there. I've always said this. If you take one step for God, he'll take a thousand for you. Now, that's a, a wrong statement because there's no way you can calculate how many steps he'll take for you. But you have to take one for him. When I was 10 years old, greatest example of this I know, when I was 10 years old and under the burden and conviction of my sin and feeling the wooing of God, I sat back there on the second row and, and when the time came for the invitation, I had to make a step to trust God. There was nothing magical about walking down there other than it was a step of obedience and confession that I wanted Christ to save me. And I, I've always said this, I took one step out and I think I floated the rest of the way. After that first step, all the rest of them were easy. 
But we got too many wilderness Christians who hadn't even taken the first step. And I can talk about just 20 different areas in our life, or 30 or 50. And I'm going to tell you, at that place, in that circumstance, God is there. God can take good, make good out of evil. He'll be with you. He will not leave you alone, and you can have rest. Mm. Verse 3, for we who have believed do enter that rest. Those of us who believe, do you believe? He says, as he has said, and here he's quoting Psalms 95 again, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Those were the ones who didn't believe. Although the works were finished before the foundation of the world. This is the thing about it. They, were, they, they, were, they saw the promised land. They saw how beautiful it was. They just didn't trust God to give it to them. But he had already promised it and given it to them all, the, all that time before. The same God of creation was with them. It was theirs. It was already theirs. It was already conquered ground. Verse 4, For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. Anybody ever read Genesis 1 and 2? On the first day, God created. And the second day, God created. In the third day, the Spirit of the God was there with him, and he created. And the fourth day, and the fifth day, and in the sixth day, all of those things, the, the power of God was manifested. God spoke it, and the power of God took it and made these wonderful things happen. And on the seventh day, it says this. He rested. Now, hold on. Was he tired? Woo, I've been creating the universe. My goodness, I'm tired. Woo, I need to sit down. I don't think so. What in the world was he trying to tell us? The word rest means a cessation. So God gave us this example. Are you listening? God took a step back and said, this is the Sabbath. We're going to rest to show us that his work continues on. He built us a day to show that he's put all these things in motion and it doesn't need your help. He's going to keep it going. And your worry is not helping anything. And your frustration is not making a difference for the good. And you're directing these people around, directing those people around. I wish they do this, and I wish they do that. And why did they do this? I don't understand this. I could pay this bill if a thousand different things. But we just have to step back and say, I just trust the Lord. I love this. Uh, I used this in the first, first service. I People get worried and they get anxious and their body gets taut. And, I mean, their, their stomach's burning and churning and their heart's beat going and, and, and they sweating and they just frustrated and they're angry and all these kind of things. And then all of a sudden you get a, I call it a holy sigh. You just kind of, you just kind of, let go. Let God. Doesn't that sound easy? Well, I tell you what, we're, we're kind of out of practice. Just saying, you know, I don't know what to do. This past week, I've had probably, I can't tell you, probably four that have come to me and they said, Pastor, I just don't understand. I just don't know what the, what's the next step. I just don't know. And I look at him and I say, I don't know. You know the truth? I don't know. But I know the one who does. And I don't have to know as long as he does. But I do have to trust him. The greatest illustration is we can take a day of rest. We can take a walk of rest. 
can take a circumstance of rest. Or, I mean, some people just live to trouble waters. They don't have to stir up their cream in their coffee. They just pick up the cup and it stirs forth. Some people don't have to brush their teeth. They just put their toothbrush up here and it brushes for them. They don't have to go buy that stuff that kills the weeds. All they have to do is spit and the grass dies. There's poison in their bodies. and God says, you were made for so much more. Verse 8 says, For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have afterwards spoken of another day. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. I'm going to give you what I think is the greatest example of rest that I know of. And it's my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know what he did for you? He did leave heaven. He did come down and live for you. He was abused and rejected. He was mocked. And they did some absolutely terrible things to him. And they crucified him on the cross. And he allowed it. He allowed it. Don't say it's going to be easy. It wasn't for him. They killed him. He gave his life. They put him in the tomb. But three days later, he came back so that we could also have life and we could have it abundantly. And he shared with his followers for 40 days and he went up there on a mountain and he raised his hands and the law of gravity was suspended and he just, he just ascended back to glory. And what it must have been like when Christ made it at home and all the people that were there and they saw him and they saw the wounds in his hands and his feet and they knew what had happened and he walks to the place of glory where the throne is and, and he, he takes where the blood could be applied for my sin and for your sin and he applies the blood and he sits down. By the way, he hadn't had to come back and preach any more sermons. His Spirit is doing that through us. His Spirit is with us, watches over us, holds us, and keeps us. By the way, listen to me now, and the work goes on. Once you move in, then you can move on. You can have your Jericho battles and move on. Today, grab your cup. I want you to see the living example. I know of no greater picture Hopefully you were given a, a cup when you came in. Inside the top, if you pull the cellophane back, you can find that little piece of bread. No leaven in the bread. Nothing needs to be added to it. No distractions. Nothing needs to be added. It's just simply what it is. Jesus with his disciples to teach them this. said, this is my body which is broken for you. Come on now, listen. And he took it and he broke it and he gave, them to it, then gave it to them. They didn't do anything to earn it. They just received it. Christ did all the work. We just are the beneficiaries of it. If I was in glory today, I would want to be at the feet of Jesus, worshiping Him for who He is and for what He has done. That needs to be our heart and our thoughts today. 
So take that bread and remember what He gave for you as you take that bread. He was broken, so you don't have to be. Then as you open up the cup, you can see the juice that represents the blood of Christ. We needed the sacrifice that was pure and complete, and that was Jesus. The Bible says the life is in the blood. He gave his life so we could have life. It had to be the pure sacrifice. Listen to me very well. It was sufficient. It made the way. There's no sin that it can't cleanse. There's no soul that it can't save. There's no life that he can't keep and hold forever and ever and ever. No sacrifice that we could make that could pay for that. He paid it for us. So with your heart bowed, let your lips receive the forgiveness of sin that comes to the blood of Jesus Christ. You can drink.